I know that you've recently had a, a close encounter with uh, with uh, James Tour. I kept getting sent this one video of him kind of like shouting and, you know, we abiogenesis, I should know, I'm an organic chemist, so I know the most about this. I looked on YouTube, I was like, debunk James Tour. Nobody's confronting this guy. Well, somebody's got to do it, so I guess I'll do it. So I made a 45 minute video. Just from that one video, he says some things, and I'm like, eh, that's not true, here's why. And uh, by the way, here's why he's saying these things. He's super, super uh, Jesus guy. I'm gonna be speaking today on the addressing abiogenesis and common misconceptions. This is gonna be a series of YouTube videos. I'm so he did this ridiculous stunt. I mean, I was kind of flabbergasted. Like, it was just a recycling of all his talking points. I now have to demonstrate with far more precision how inept James is in commenting on this field. And to those who insist that a PhD is a prerequisite for discussing science, this round will include some special guests just for you. In order to make my response as good as it was, I did correspond with a number of Origin of Life researchers. So obviously a couple of them agreed to appear in the videos, but I talked to a lot more. I talked to most most of them. Uh, I talked to most of the prominent ones. Um, and uh, mo the response from most of them was, and I won't name them by name because they didn't want to be involved in that video, was just like, look, this guy's a fraud. I really want the synthetic chemists, my synthetic chemist colleagues to critique me. Uh, is there something that I'm teaching in here that's synthetically incorrect? Let me know. Well, you asked for it, so let's chat with Bruce a little bit. This is not new. What we have advanced, of course, are designer surfactants that enable synthetic chemistry. Firstly, I have never seen what you are referring to, I am also curious why you claim that I am aligned in any way with either side of this debate. Dave asked me to comment on some of your writings, and specifically about what we are doing, chemistry and water, and does this show, prove you wrong in what you say. It was not my intention to align, or misalign, with anyone, I tried to also make that clear to Dave, if it comes across that I am in his camp, then that's unfortunate, I am only in my camp. What you sent as a clip is news to me. I never approved any of this. In this ooze emerged the first life. I find it problematic in that there's an extrapolation from a very small experiment in a laboratory. Researchers have now created life from non-living parts. There were many kinds of molecules in the primordial soup. I'm boiling up some primordial soup. Your entire civilization, it all begins right here in this little pond of goo. Now for the peptides. I talked about this briefly in my original video, and he didn't like it. You're gonna do condensation reactions in water? I don't understand why some would suggest that you do condensation reactions in an ocean like this, uh, in water. How can that be? Tell me about that. How do you do condensation reactions in water? Have you any references on these claims? Uh-oh, someone didn't do his homework. Peptide synthesis in water is not a problem, James, because it is not a matter of equilibrium. He bets I don't have any papers on this, but sorry, I have many. Here are just a few. You see that my complaint to Dave was that he showed a picture of amino acids, amino acids, and I'll say it again, amino acids that are zwitterionic in their native state in water, polymerizing into polypeptides. That's what he showed. So then he brought in Lee Cronin, and he says Lee Cronin to, to justify making amino acids in water. And of course, beyond these techniques in water, James displays his total lack of imagination regarding any relevant environmental processes or geological surfaces. To start, let's check in with Lee Cronin again regarding peptide formation using wet-dry cycles. So, he brings in Lee Cronin to talk about this paper right here, formation of oligopeptides in high yield under simple programmable conditions. We talked about this in the last video. These peptides were not formed in water. 
They were formed in a dry state at 130 degrees, which is above sterilization temperature for 15 hours. Sterilization temperature is 125 degrees or less than 130 degrees for 15 minutes at least. This is 15 hours. It's interesting because the peptides are formed in the absence of water, in the dry state, not in an aqueous state. If David read this paper, he would see that actually Lee Cronin agrees with me. He says within that paper, studies have explored peptide synthesis on clays, minerals, at air-water interface, on metal oxide surfaces, and under hydrothermal conditions, resulting in very low yields, typically less than 1% of oligomeric products where N was greater than 3. That means more than 3 amino acids hooked together. The difficulty arises as the condensation of amino acid monomers to form peptide bonds in aqueous solution, which is what we're talking about here, is hampered by both unfavorable kinetics and thermodynamics. That means equilibrium. That is, the formation of the peptide bonds is slow and in aqueous solution, the reagents are thermodynamically more stable than the peptide products. That means that the amino acids themselves are more stable than the, the peptide products, the polypeptides. So it goes back in the other direction. Right here in the very paper that Dave Farina showed, I'm not taking any other papers, I'm just using the papers that he showed. He bets I don't have any papers on this, but sorry, I have many. Hey everyone, as you know by He misunderstood now, the paper. That's the problem that Dave has. The last video series I went through, I mean, I just had a grand time with the one paper that he showed and showed over and over again how he misunderstood that paper. Now, he misunderstood this paper and he's going to understand, uh, misunderstand the next one and the next one because he doesn't have the ability to understand to read the documents. He reads one little line and he thinks he's got it. Okay, here's a paper. It says peptide formation in aqueous solution. Like, that's the title of the paper, so you're wrong and lying, you know. The title is literally Life as a Manifestation of the Second Law of Thermodynamics. But I'm just excited to be in a place where I can read papers on those topics and like mm -hmm. kind of understand them, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah. Pre pretty yeah. much get get what, what the paper's talking about. You know, I know how to read papers. I, they're comprehensible to me, sometimes with some difficulty, but you know, I, I understand chemistry. You can't like, uh, it, it's not gibberish to me. I may have to look into stuff a little bit. No, you got to read the documents, got to read the experimental conditions, and you got to see what's going on. Okay, so then Dave invites in a synthetic organic chemist, Professor Bruce Lipschitz, to comment on my video series. That's great, comment on my video series. I invited the comment. And how about this approach from Bruce Lipschitz of UC Santa Barbara? He's a synthetic organic chemist, just like you, James. He has devised some interesting methods using designer surfactants to form peptide bonds in water at room temperature. I really want the synthetic chemists, my synthetic chemist colleagues, to critique me. Uh, is there something that I'm teaching in here that's synthetically incorrect? Let me know. Well, you asked for it, so let's chat with Bruce a little bit. This is not new. What we have advanced, of course, are designer surfactants that enable synthetic chemistry to take place, but it's within this overall realm of biological-like molecules that have been around forever that enable chemistry to take place in water, and that includes chemistry that leads to the extrusion of water. And so, for example, if we have a reaction that generates water cycloaromatization, for example, we've done, the byproduct is water. Now, it's counterintuitive. One would say, well, how could you do that? You're in water. Doesn't the water shift the equilibrium such that it's almost impossible to kick out water when you're in water? Well, the answer is no. <laughs> it's not impossible. In fact, it happens all the time because we are inside of a hydrophobic pocket. The water is surrounding the soap, the micelle, the vesicle, the surfactant, whatever you want to call it, it's surrounding it, but it doesn't matter. And so when a reaction generates water as a byproduct, a condensation reaction we talk about all the time in sophomore organic chemistry, doesn't matter. That water gets kicked out into the water, but no problem, because inside of that pocket, that's actually the driving force to kick that water out. The fact that it goes into the water is irrelevant 
there's no shifting of any equilibrium. The reaction is over. The product is made. Beyond what Bruce said about involvement with lipids, peptide coupling with a suitable activator in water is exergonic, so this chemistry is not specific to hydrophobic pockets. Of course, neither those reagents nor Bruce's methodology are prebiotically relevant, although the concept sure is, but more importantly, they demonstrate that peptide synthesis in water is absolutely not a problem. And given the fact that Bruce is a synthetic organic chemist, just like James, and not an origin of life researcher, James has no excuse for being totally unaware of this aqueous chemistry. So he brings in uh, Bruce Lipschitz to comment, and, uh, and he says peptide synthesis in water is absolutely no problem. Peptide synthesis in water is not a problem, James. Now, my teaching on amino acids to bring us up to speed, this I'm taking from the peptide uh, series that I went through on, on the peptide section. How do you make peptides? Peptides are made from amino acids. And this will give you a little bit of background on amino acid chemistry and peptides. Dave, listen to this teaching. Listen to this. I'm going to teach you something. You really could learn here. You could learn what amino acids are, what Zwitter ionic means versus not being Zwitter ionic. So amino acids contain both an amine, amino group right there and a carboxylic acid and they exist as Zwitter ions, meaning that this is a base, this is an acid, so this base takes that acidic proton, so they exist as a plus minus Zwitter ions, which are two opposite charges are in the same molecule. Alpha amino acids have the amino group on the carbon alpha to the carboxylic acid. There's the carboxylic acid. Here's the alpha carbon. On that carbon is the amine. Peptides are biologically important polymers comprised of amino acids connected by the peptide bond. Here's the peptide bond. So here's an amino acid. Here's another amino acid. This R group means general groups that hang off. Proteins are very large peptides. Some are aggregates of more than one peptide. And some of these proteins are enzymes, meaning they do catalysis. They, they are the, the, the little building nanomachines of, of the cell. All right, there are 20 common naturally occurring amino acids. We've got to have syntheses for all of these things. So here's the amino acids, the R group. This R group is different on each one of them. And they have the name, for example, glycine. It's gly, and it's given the one-letter description G. So everything has got a three-letter description and a one-letter description. And you have all of these different groups that you can have on there. These are reactive groups. So what happens when people show the types of slides they showed uh, that we saw earlier, they always had that R group, but they never showed the problems. When you have unprotected amino acids, you get, you get unplanned couplings. It doesn't work. Here's more of the amino acids. Here's some have hydroxyl groups, some have mercaptan, here's a thiol, a sulfide, some have other carboxylic acids hanging off that would compete with the carboxylic acid of the amino acid uh, main moiety itself. Some have amines hanging off. These would compete with the amino end of the amino acid. So these are all big problems in synthesis. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at the paper that Dave Farina, the very paper, I'm not bringing other, other papers, the very paper that Dave Farina cited, we're gonna look at it. And so here's the paper that he cited, and let's zoom in on this a little bit more. Here are the reagents. Bruce is not using amino acids in water. He's not. He's got a carboxylic acid coupling with an amine. He does not have free amino acids. They're not amino acids. They're not Zwitter ionic. Now, he does the chemistry. It's got water around it, but the chemistry is happening in a hydrophobic pocket. We are inside of a hydrophobic pocket. He adds in organic compounds, large organic compounds, and these molecules slide in. What Dave Farina showed is that, that amino acids polymerize in water, 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 not in a hydrophobic pocket. Even in the hydrophobic pocket that Bruce has, he's not doing amino acid coupling, no way, because they would never go in his hydrophobic pocket if they were Zwitter or ionic. It wouldn't go in there. You can look, this is exactly the picture from Dave's video that he showed. He showed some ocean and the free amino acids coupling together. The free amino acids coupling together. This is what he showed repeatedly. 
And here's what I showed on the video is that amino acids exist in its vitroionic form because this base takes that proton from that acid and so you have an acid-base reaction within the same molecule. These are extremely water soluble at this point. These don't go into hydrophobic pockets. So how did Bruce get his coupling to go? Because he didn't use these. What he did is he made this so it's no longer basic on one of the components and he made this so it's no longer acidic on another component and he took the acid and the base residues that were left and coupled those together. Those were not coupling of free amino acids. Now, I, I think Dave just doesn't know this. You could have learned something if you watched those videos with an open mind. You could have learned about this. So I'm teaching you again. I don't know if you're going to be teachable, but I hope you are. These are what amino acids are. They're zwitterionic, and they won't go into a hydrophobic pocket. They won't couple in water. Even your own expert, Lee, said that these favor the free amino acid, not the polypeptide when they're in water. That's why Lee gets rid of all the water by heating to well over the boiling point of water. He dries the thing out and he drives those two molecules together. That's the way Lee does it. The way Bruce does it is what he does is he protects the amine group on one component so that's no longer basic. So he puts a benzyl oxycarbonyl, it was formerly called carboxy, uh, benzyl, that's why they got the nomenclature CBZ for that protecting group. And with the acid, he converted it to an ester to leave just one amine here in a protonated state, but it's not zwitterionic, just leaving one amine and one carboxylic acid to couple. One amine coupling to one carboxylic acid. But this is just a normal carboxylic acid amine coupling. This is making an amide. This is not making a peptide linkage. This is not making a peptide in the sense that you have free amino acids. There are no free amino acids here. Nature doesn't have a CBZ group to protect this. Nature doesn't make esters to protect this, to do these couplings. Nature goes on the free amino acids, just like you showed on your picture, just like I said, it can't happen. Let's look a little bit further at this paper, which you cite. Did you, did you really open the paper and look at it? You, you put a copy of the, uh, of the front page. Did you open the paper to look at it? You know, I know how to read papers. I, they're comprehensible to me, sometimes with some difficulty. Look at every coupling that, that Bruce Lipschitz did. Every coupling that he did had the CBZ group protecting the amine on one component. And every coupling that he did had an ester. Here's an ethyl ester, here's an allyl ester, ethyl ester protecting the other end. Here's a methyl ester protecting the other end. So these are not free amino acids coupling. And why did he have to put these big CBZ groups on it? To make them hydrophobic so that they would go into his non-aqueous environment. So he functionalized the molecules to drive them away from the water and into the hydrophobic pocket, as he calls it. Every one of Bruce's free amines has an ester alpha to it, not a free acid. Every one of his amines that he doesn't want to use has a CBC group or a BAC group. That's a, a T-butoxy carbonyl group, another big moiety on there. None of these are amino acid couplings. Dave, listen to me. There are no amino acid couplings going on here in water. None. Yes, he, of course, he has activators too, but let's put that aside. He has, he has these unnatural activators, which you cited, unnatural activators, but put that aside. There's no amino acid coupling. So when you say that peptide formation in water is absolutely no problem, you're absolutely wrong again. Also, none of his examples have side chains. Remember I showed you, I showed you that list of amino acids. About half of them have active side chains. Some have OH groups, some have SH groups, some have NH2 groups, amine groups, some have carboxylic acid groups. You have to protect those or they would get involved. So this is a totally, totally loaded system. Bruce Lipschitz was not coupling amino acids. None of his compounds were zwitterionic. Remember what I taught you about zwitterionic, has a plus and a minus charge. None of his compounds had that because when he puts a CBZ group up there or a Bach group there, that amine is now alpha and that amine is now hooked onto a carbonyl. Its lone pair is withdrawn. The electron density is withdrawn into the carbonyl so it's no longer basic. All of his amines were protected. All of the carboxyl groups were esterified, the ones that he didn't want to undergo the reaction. All of the substrates were rendered minimally soluble in water because they were no longer zwitterionic, and he put big groups on the amines to drive those things into the hydrophobic pocket. 
All of his couplings were done in, in a hydrophobic pocket, not in water, but in a hydrophobic pocket. Yes, it may have been water surrounding that, but it was done in a hydrophobic pocket. It was done within an organic framework, not in water. So none of his chosen systems had active side chains. Bruce totally loaded this thing because active side chains would have thrown this thing off. And Bruce confesses to that, as you'll see. But most of all, he was not coupling amino acids. This was loaded to the extreme. No such joy for early Earth. I mean, not just the bad arguments, but there are so many instances where it's just like, look, I caught you misquoting this person. You took the, you, you, you pasted this, you snipped something out. You know, you're twisting the, these words. Like, it's just very, very blatant. It's undeniable that he's not just not understanding the science he doesn't want to understand. He's actively lying. If you're enjoying this series, give us a thumbs up and click the subscribe button. And that way you'll hear when we're coming out with new videos. There are no salaried employees in this organization. All the accounting, all the legal work, that's all done by friends of mine. The only thing that I have to pay for is the production work. And if you could help us out with that, I'd appreciate it. There's a link below where you can just click on that and help us in several different ways. Thank you.